Let's continue. It's also possible to consider all of this as a criticism of the blind spots of Spanish imperialism, its hypocrisy exposed despite some of its soldiers' best intentions. Notice how the narrator's voice intervenes to describe Don Quixote's transformation into a kind of diabolical machine. Oh, God help me, how great was the anger that took hold of Don Quixote upon hearing the audacious words of his squire. It was so great, I say, that with trembling voice and stammering tongue, flinging living fire from his eyes, he said, oh, roguish villain, boorish, insolent, ignorant, ill-spoken, foul-mouthed, impudent, backbiter, and slanderer. And so saying, he raised his eyebrows, puffed out his cheeks, looked about everywhere, and stamped the ground violently with his right foot, all signs of the great rage pent up in his heart. Then, after Dorotea says that what Sancho saw was caused by the inn's persistent enchantments, her defense of Sancho's intentions stresses the idea that he has articulated a rational moral judgment. Perhaps he has not said this without cause, nor can we suspect that his proper reasoning and Christian conscience has borne false witness against anyone. Finally, Fernando parodies the inquisitorial formula for a pardon, asking Don Quixote to forgive his squire Restore him to the bosom of your grace, secut erat in principio, or as it was in the beginning, words from the Gloria Patri prayer read during the Inquisition's ceremonies of religious reconciliation. Okay, Cervantes' famous perspectivism is on the rise here, and we should note this scene's fluctuating morality. If this all alludes to the captive's tale, with Sancho playing the role of an old Christian who doubts the religious status of people like the renegade or Thoraida, and Don Quixote insisting on the need to look beyond appearances, then the Hidalgo's anger is morally justifiable according to a humanist reconciliation between Moriscos and Spaniards. However, if this all alludes to the Micomicon venture, then Don Quixote is indeed diabolical, and Sancho's doubts in his role as a disillusioned slaver make room for a moral critique of the new transatlantic trade in black Africans. Why not accept that Cervantes' art suggests both perspectives? In any case, although Sancho seems willing to believe Dorotea's enchantment explanation, he still clings to his empirical skepticism regarding the blanketing experience, as if he knows full well what it's like to be treated like a slave. Sancho's foolishness never reached such a degree that he did not believe it to be a pure and verified truth without any mixture of deceit that he had been blanketed by people of flesh and blood, not dreamed or imagined phantoms as his master believed and claimed. In other words, Sancho's disillusionment evinces a moral saying, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. At the end of the chapter, Don Quixote's return home requires another theatrical performance. It's both hilarious and thematic. The problem is how to procure the cure of his lunacy back home without requiring the company of Dorotea and Fernando who are proceeding to Seville. The solution is to mimic Lancelot's journey in The Night of the Cart by Chrétien de Troyes. Everyone dresses as ghosts, except for Sancho, and they enclose Don Quixote in an ox cart. Meanwhile, the first barber, that is, not the one of the saddle, but the other one, recites a prophecy explaining why Don Quixote must travel in the cage. The scene reviews many themes, racial mixing, and cross-cultural marriage, because the problematic adventure will end when Don Quixote marries Dulcinea, when the raging spotted lion and the white tabosan dove are yoked together as one, by whose unprecedented union shall be brought forth into the light of the world brave cubs who shall imitate the ravening claws of their valiant father. The materialistic body contrasted with metaphysical ghosts, because Sancho 
did not fail to recognize who all these misshapen figures really were and the moral conflict between forced slavery and work for pay because the barber directs part of the prophecy to Sancho. The promises shall remain unbroken which your good Lord hast made you and I assure thee on the authority of the wise Mentironiana that thy salary shall be paid thee as thou shalt see in due course. The barber's performance is hilarious, especially his last words and the way he varies his voice to achieve a magical effect. And because I am not allowed to say any more, may God keep you, for now I'm going back to where only I know. And as he ended the prophecy, he raised his voice to a high pitch and then let it tail off so softly that even those who knew it was all an act were inclined to believe that what they heard was true. The chapter ends with Don Quixote expressing his absolute confidence in Sancho. Notice in particular his substitution of a salary or some other reward equivalent to the famous island that he has promised his squire. I trust in his kindness and in his good behavior such that he will not abandon me for better fortune or for worse because if it comes about either by his ill luck or my own that I am unable to grant him the island or some equivalent thing which I have promised him, at least his salary shall not be lost for in my will, which is already written, I have declared the sum that shall be paid to him. To sum up, note the extreme violence that arises from the debate over the bashelmet and the saddle. It's funny, yes, but it's also bloody and almost unavoidable. It's as if the mysterious inn in the Sierra Morena between Castilla-La Mancha and Andalucia were always on the brink of a civil war. But the priest and Don Fernando solve everything with money. Meanwhile, Don Quixote plays two symbolic roles. On the one hand, he forcefully resists the officers of the state in their mission to arrest him. On the other hand, at the end of the litigious proceedings, when he's literally made a captive, caged, and subjected to the yoke of marriage, our hero begins his journey toward what is expected to be his healing. All of the novel's major themes are at stake. The proper limits of the law, the immorality of slavery, the socializing effects of commerce, the modern definition of a gentleman or caballero, and the ultimate contrast between war and peace. Cervantes is clearly guiding us toward a climax. Simultaneously, the text becomes highly self-reflexive as various characters refer us to earlier passages that contradict the very existence of the bashelmet. Finally, notice Cervantes' relentless materialism, that is, his constant contrasts between the reality of the body and the metaphysical fantasy involved in the existence of ghosts. This materialism is rigorously accompanied by the issue of Sancho's salary, as it was in the previous episodes of The Dead Body and The Fulling Mills. Passages like these suggest that the great philosopher Thomas Hobbes read Don Quixote very carefully, because in his great treatise, Leviathan, the Englishman's materialism also accompanied his vision of the inevitable commodification of human labor. In short, there's no metaphysical reality that should interest us. We're all alone down here, and we had better figure out ways to get along, or else we'll end up killing each other.